Well, I don't know about you, but I am blown away this time of year as things are just growing like crazy around us, right? I'm not talking about that in a figurative sense. I mean literally growing like the trees and the plants and the bushes. Any of you have maybe a tree or a bush or, or trees or bushes in your yard or, or some, something that you are involved with in that way, you know how all of a sudden things at this time of year are just booming and growing and you're like, oh, my arms to this day are still killing me from holding up that hedge trimmer last week and trying to cut some of those high bushes. It was an exercise that I just do not, you know, prepare for, that, that at least that one time of year. Now we have this one little bush. Okay, this one's not my bush, but I have one that looks identical to it. I didn't catch it at this season to take the picture of it, okay? But I think it's more appropriately referred to as an ornamental grass, right, that we have. And, and it's that time where, you know, it, it just hits the season um, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the fall into the winter where the thing just is dying, it's, it's brown, it looks dead, and you have to trim it back like this. You have to cut it back. And, you know, we didn't know this going back a few years ago, right? And then eventually we, we you know, were taught that and we began to realize some things. And, and I'm amazed because this thing that looks so dry and dead and that there's nothing good that's going to come out from this thing, all of a sudden, now this is what it really looks like in uh, my, my yard there. This is what it actually turns into looking like. And I'm, I'm amazed how something that looks so dry and so dead can all of a sudden become something so vibrant and beautiful. Listen to me. Something so dry and so dead that God is able to transform into something so vibrant and beautiful. And by the way, unless that's Jesus calling, please silence your phones. <laughs> Folks, as we come to the book of Ezekiel, God's people are looking anything but vibrant and beautiful. In fact, they are in many ways as good as dead, without hope and without a future as they sit in a land of captivity. In fact, Psalm 137 reflects back on this time when the psalmist writes, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? And Ezekiel there in a foreign land, the land of Babylon, is faced with the heart-wrenching responsibility of declaring faithfully God's message of judgment, God's message of wrath, not only against the nations at large, but against his very own people, the people of Israel, essentially saying that things were not going to just immediately get better. No, things were actually going to go from bad to worse as a result of the people's corruption and idolatry as he warns them of imminent and utter destruction uh, as Israel's beloved city of Jerusalem would be destroyed. And sure enough, how many of you know when God says it, it's going to happen? Amen. Good, bad, and the ugly. When God says it, it's going to happen. Jerusalem falls. To everyone's dismay, the beloved city of Jerusalem is brought down by the hands of the Babylonians. Recent images coming out of the Ukraine can only begin to give us an idea of the devastation and disaster that shook the people of Jerusalem, as the Babylonians came upon them like a ferocious beast. 
It's no wonder that the psalmist lamented in agony as that psalm goes on at 137. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Can you begin to get a picture of what the people of Israel went through at the hands of the Babylonians? The people of God are ruined. They are utterly and totally ruined as they sit in a land of captivity. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. Tell somebody next to you. That's not the end of the story. <laughs> Folks, I don't care what you've gone through. I don't care what you've faced. Thank you, Eric, today for showing us there was more to the story. Amen. There was more to your story. There's more to your story and mine. And I want you to see today there's more for the story when it comes to God's people, the church, God's people in Messiah Jesus. God's people. You see, once Jerusalem falls, Ezekiel's message now changes. Much like the other prophets will see, uh, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel's message goes from a message of disaster and destruction to one of hope and restoration. Aren't you thankful for hope and restoration? I know you didn't come in here today to simply hear about disaster and destruction, but there's a time for it. There's a time for it. There's a wake-up call for it. But there's also a time to hear that word that says, that says, but I will restore. I will repair. I will give hope. I will give hope. And Ezekiel tells the people that things might look bad. Things might look hopeless. But that's not the end of the story. For there would come a day when God's people would return to the land to worship their God and Savior under a true and faithful shepherd and king. And God would give them a new heart. And listen, and he would put his spirit in them. Amen. Listen to me. He would put his spirit in them. His ruach in them. Picking up at Ezekiel chapter 37, we read, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath, ruach, it's wind, it's spirit, it's breath, enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Listen, then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. As, as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I just want to tell you when God is at work, there's noise, there's a sound. There's something that God's doing that begins to all of a sudden cause us to go, what is this that we hear? What is this that's happening? Bone to bone. And I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But listen, but there, can you read it with me? But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, 
I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Father, we thank you that your word is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. God piercing, Lord God, judging the thoughts and intentions of our hearts and lives, dividing soul and spirit and joint and marrow, God. And we pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would drive your word deep, deep into our bones today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Listen, nobody felt more defeated, more hopeless than the people of Israel. Earlier in the book of Ezekiel and elsewhere in the Bible, we're told of supposed prophets, supposed prophets who came and made big promises about the people of God never being taken into captivity, never experiencing uh, that, type of, that type of devastation, and certainly never remaining in captivity and in exile as long as they were and would be. And they declared that there would be peace. Peace. God's word warns us of a time when they'll be saying peace. Peace and sudden destruction will come upon them. They had a message of peace. We all love the fluffy messages. We all love the messages that make us feel good and just sort of give us some goosebumps and, and send us home with just warm, you know, hot chocolate-like feelings, you know? And they assured the people that the city of Jerusalem and its walls would stand. They would stand. But sure enough, darkness and gloom swept in as the people were ripped from their homeland and suffered utter devastation on so many levels. Talk about a fleeing and a feeling of what it means to be a fugitive and a refugee. And to put the ultimate nail in the coffin, their beloved city of Jerusalem, the heart city of God's people, the place where God would meet with them by means of the temple, it was now burned down to the ground. Walls, temple, and everything. So it's no wonder that Ezekiel is not simply given a vision of the slain or of the fallen, but a vision of a valley of bones. And not just of bones, of bones that were dry, but not simply dry, but that were, as it says, yabeshot meod, very Dry. Very dry. In other words, it wasn't just unlikely that the people of God were going to come back from this one. It was downright impossible. Impossible. But how many of you know that our impossibilities are God's opportunities to show himself true and faithful and mighty, and powerful. Can you say amen? amen? How many of you know that our God is a God who specializes in taking his people, as I want us to see today, from bones to breakthrough? Amen. From bones to breakthrough. Folks, would you hear me today? And please receive this in the best spirit possible. The reality is that the church, the people of God, I know we have snapshots of some great things God's doing here and doing there in this church and that movement, but please listen to me for a moment. The reality is that the church, the people of God, in many ways are like that valley of dry bones. Admit it or not, we have suffered defeat and failure on so many levels. 
There's compromise. There's immorality right within God's people that we all know gets blown up in the news and on social media when it has to do with a well-known personality or charismatic figure in the church. But what about all those other situations and people that the news and social media don't cover or care about? What about all those family members and churchgoers who will never trust God again? Who will never enter a church again because of a trusted individual in the church who lied to them, betrayed them, or broke their trust? What about the idols that we've created right within the church? People that we have placed on pedestals only to realize that the higher we place them, the less people they have around them, the less accountability they have around them, and the harder and the farther they fall, and the more people they take down with them. And what about those who have made big promises and spoken big prophecies presumptuously, please hear me, presumptuously. I don't care how much scripture they use. I don't care how many thus saith the Lord's they use. They've spoken in presumption. Big prophecies, big promises, declaring at times, even within our movement, great harvests, mighty healings, financial blessings. Man, we know a young man who is scarred for years spiritually as a big name healer and evangelist said, You're healed to his mother, only for her within a short amount of time to die, to die. I'm talking about those who have made predictions about political candidates, even Jesus' return. But in the end, they only make the body of Christ a laughing stock in the eyes of the unchurched world. And they cause others to walk away from the church altogether because their words never come true. Why? Because they spoke in presumption, not in obedience. And what about our syncretism, our, our going to bed with the world that has resulted in a polluted church and a watered-down gospel that's more concerned with our feelings than our salvation. With songs that speak more about who God makes me to be than who God is. Hallelujah. Who God is. And what about the way that the church has paraded our convictions but has lacked in compassion? Should it be that we're more quickly identified with a political party than with our Savior and Lord Jesus? Should it be with what we stand against rather than what we stand for? Add to all this the fact that there is a tide of sin, an agenda of Satan, that the church seems helpless to slow down, let alone stop or prevent, from crashing onto the shores of our society right into the rooms of our public schools. You see, when you put all these pieces together and you look at the plight of the church, I mean, you take a real hard look at what's happening statistically and realistically in the culture, both here and around the world, but we'll start here. What's happening to a world in which a generation is no longer growing up just trying to decide what to be, but now they're trying to decide what gender to be. You can't help but feel that the church is in many ways much like the people of God in Ezekiel's day, without hope, without a future. It's pointless. It's useless. Just drop a few more bones. There's no chance of making a difference in this world. We're just like that valley of dead, very dry bones. <sighs> Folks, we need to face that reality of where we are at large in this culture. But please hear me. 
Don't you dare forget for a moment the reality of a God who conquered sin, death, hell, Satan, and the grave. Don't you forget that we have a God who takes us from condemnation to salvation, from death to life. Listen, a God who brings us from captivity to freedom, from brokenness to healing, from mourning to rejoicing, from wailing to dancing, from bones, bones to breakthrough. And if there's ever been a time when the church needed a breakthrough, it is now. Tell your neighbor, it's now. now. We're desperate for it now. Now. Right here, right now. In fact, you got to give it to Ezekiel. Because when God asks him, son of man, can these bones live? I just wait. God, is that a rhetorical question? Are you actually looking for me to like give you an answer here? Ezekiel knows, humanly speaking, it's not happening. There's no way that something is going to now, life is somehow now going to come from these dead, very dry bones. So instead, I love what he does. He sort of like turns the answer back into the lap of the Lord, it seems. Sovereign Lord, Lord, you know. Lord, you alone know the answer here to that one. Lord, I don't want to just answer in my finite thinking, in my logic, in my limitations. So Lord, I defer back to you, to your knowledge, your power, your might, because I know that the things which are impossible with me, God, they're possible with you. They're possible with you. And folks, I still want to tell you, that word still stands true today. The things which are impossible for man, for us, are possible for God. Yeah, for God. Man, Mary found that out quite certainly. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. I'm going to give birth to a baby. I've never even been with a man. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. I believe Ezekiel knew it. And I pray today that you and I would know it deep in our bones. Nothing. And you and I, we might have no idea how God is going to do it. How God is going to bring revival. How God is going to bring life to his church in a way like we've never experienced before. How God is going to bring us from bones to breakthrough. But rest assured, he knows. He knows. Tell somebody, he knows. Even when you and I have no clue, he knows. You might not know, but God knows. And notice what Ezekiel saw happen to these bones as they came together. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But once again, read that part with me. But there was no breath in them. I don't know about you, but I cannot help but see a picture of what God's people then and now are often like. Where there's an appearance of life but a desperate lack thereof. An appearance of life, but a desperate lack of it that still exists. It was true in Ezekiel's day. Man, it was true in Jesus' day. And he made it so clear to the people. It was true in Isaiah's day. And folks, unfortunately, it's still true in our day. No matter how much you dress up the corpse, no matter how pretty or good you might make it look, when you have a corpse that has no breath, no matter how beautiful, no matter what you do to that corpse, without any breath in it, it's still a corpse. And I can tell you this, God did not call me to just dress up a corpse. And he hasn't called you either. In whatever capacity he's placed his finger on your heart to serve him within his church, within his body, he's not called you and me to simply dress up a corpse. He didn't call me to just go through the motions of playing a religious part while missing the reality of his spirit. He didn't call me to just dress up a church and make it look pretty on the outside while it's dead and dying on the inside. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord. No, he reached his hand, folks, into my soul. And he called me out of my sin. He broke, me, broke those chains right off of me. 
and set me free from the things that I was powerless to set myself free from. And he called me. I don't know why exactly me, but, but he called me to pastor, to deliver his word to a people I believe that he wants to bring and continue to bring from, bro from bones to breakthrough. From bones to breakthrough, yes. Folks, we as a church, can I just speak personally as Faith Assembly of God, 921, it used to be South Main Street, then it became, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, yes, we have past stains on our hands. I'm not sure of too many churches that don't. And if you came into this church today thinking, we have found it, the perfect church, guess what? One of us just ruined that. One of us just ruined that. It was probably both of us. It's not the case. I don't know of a perfect family. And we are a family, the family of God. You've got an aunt that acts like this, an uncle that does this, kids that do this. It's a dysfunctional family. We all have them. And that's the story of all our churches. His church. But he's making us. Oh, what he's making us into. How Janice was praying, the Lord was just speaking today. Oh, what he's making us into is something beautiful. Something beautiful. His bride. But listen, we have stains, past stains on our hands. We have seen division. We have seen discord. We have seen racism. We have seen egotism. We have suffered from complacency and from apathy, from a lack of submission, not just to God, but to spiritual leaders. A lack of submission, uh, uh, an ignoring of our great commission. But I have to believe in my heart of hearts based on a God who takes his people from bones to break through that greater things are yet to come. Greater things, as Chris Tomlin wrote, are still to be done. In this village, in this region, not just in this church, but through this church. And I pray that it would continue to reach to the nations. The nations. But folks, if we don't have the breath of God, the Spirit of God, if we're not desperate, if we're not hungry, if we're not open, if we're not seeing the wind of God, the Spirit of God at work in our midst, we might look good on the outside. Nice building, nice cup of coffee, nice people, nice pastor, good music, whatever it might be, but we will be lacking at best and spiritually dead at worst. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute there. You, you say this about the church. But we already have the promised Holy Spirit. We've already got it. We're alive. I just want to say to you, don't always be so sure. Don't simply take my word for it. Take Jesus. Because he had a few things to say to a church in the first century. And he said to one, to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds, church, but you have a reputation of being alive. But you are dead. You are dead. Folks, I don't want a reputation. I want the reality. Anybody with me? I don't want to ever settle for a reputation. Big, big things are built on reputations only for things to fall really, really hard when there's no reality. I don't want a reputation. I want the reality. God wants the reality of his spirit in our lives, in his church. But the thing that I just want to encourage you with today is that he wants that for you and me. He wants that for us as his people far more than you and I could ever want that for ourselves. He wants that for you and me far more than you and I could ever want that for ourselves. The reality and the move of his spirit within his people. In fact, that's part of the beauty of our passage in Ezekiel. Because God was going to do something for his people, but not because or as long as his people did this or, or did that. 
That's not the picture we're given here. No, because God was choosing to make it happen. God said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. In fact, when you think about the imagery that Ezekiel has given, this valley of very dry bones, it only drives home the point that this was not about the people being able to do something to bring about this promise of restoration and new life. I'm not a biologist, but I can tell you with pretty good level of certainty that dead, dry bones don't just, you know, spontaneously come to life. This was not about a people who somehow, you know, had to get their act together, or somehow had to become good enough, or somehow had to become qualified to now come to life. Instead, this was all about God's sovereign, loving decision promise and doing. This was about what he said he was going to do. And then a supernatural fulfillment of that. Sure enough, when the time had come, about 70 years later, about, in a way that no one but God himself could bring to pass, God brought his people back to the land to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the walls, to serve him in Jerusalem once again. Can you say amen? amen? But wait, that was only a foretaste of what God had promised. You see, this cycle would happen again, even up to our own day. This cycle of God's people becoming corrupt, doing things their own way, ultimately rejecting their very Messiah and King who had entered into their midst. You see, this was only a foretaste of what God had promised. There was so much more for them to come. There was a new covenant, even as we celebrated today, that God promised his people still to come. A time when the sins of his people would once and for all be paid for, that there would be forgiveness. It would be a covenant not like the covenant that God had made with his people earlier on. A covenant that they had broken time and again. Again, a time when he would put this new covenant, his spirit, within them. I want you to fast forward with me about 500 plus years from Ezekiel's time. And a group of Jewish men and women are gathered together praying. They're still awaiting the promise of God's breath, this Ruach HaKodesh, this Holy Spirit, His Spirit to come and fill them. It was less than two months ago that Jesus told them over their final Passover meal together that God's promised new covenant had come. Less than two months before this time. And His resurrection from the dead from a Roman crucifixion, to say the least, only drilled home the point that what he had to say was not to be taken lightly. That the new covenant that he spoke of in fulfillment of the Hebrew prophets was truly now upon them. So now, as they gather together today, even as Jewish neighbors and people all around us in this location and in this time zone gather even today, on this feast of Shavuos, this feast of Pentecost. They were there in Jerusalem, where it was packed once again with the worshipers coming together. And the question was this, would the promise of God's Spirit, the promise that He would fill the lives of His people, would it truly come to pass? Acts chapter 2 tells us, when the day of Pentecost, this Feast of Shavuot, came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound 
like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Can you say praise God? Folks, what God did in bringing his people back to the land decades after Ezekiel's vision was only a foretaste of what God had promised. God had so much more for his people, and he still does. He still does. What those first believers in Messiah Jesus, those first Jewish believers, what they experienced on that Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost, what they experienced is still available for you and me today in Jesus. Tell your neighbor, it's for you. It's for you. On that festival, on that time together, as people were gathered together for worship Jews from around the known world, Peter preached the message. He preached the message. And I was astounded to find that this is a time not only when they celebrate, when Jewish, belief, Jewish people around us celebrate when the, the law, the Torah was given to Moses and through Moses, but, but they also remember and celebrate and, and remember the time of King David's passing. King David's passing. This was a new one to me. I didn't know this was part of this festival. And I thought, wait, Jewish people are remembering a time of King David's past. Wait a minute. On that day of Shavuot, on that festival of Pentecost, Peter preached a message. And as he pointed the people to Jesus, he pointed them to David's tomb. And he said, I want to assure you that David... David is still dead, and the one that he was speaking of, he is the Messiah, he is the Lord, Jesus who is risen. Jesus who is risen. And I said, wow, this makes so much more sense now as he's speaking this message, if this was truly the case back in the first century as well. And I want to tell you today, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Folks, it's for you. It's for you. This promise, he said, is for you. It's for your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. I just want you to take that deep into your bones today and recognize God would say to you and me today, it's for you. This promise of life, this promise of my spirit within you. And Jesus and Peter said, it's found in Jesus. It's found in Jesus. I'm talking about a new covenant that God has promised for you and me that promises us forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now don't miss it. Because sure, there were things that these men and, and women did to position themselves to receive what God had for them. And we, we spoke all about that. You can listen to last week's message if you want to. But don't miss the fact that nobody, but nobody, but God alone could make this happen. Nobody, but nobody. Nobody but God could have sent the wind of his spirit on the very day when Jewish people around the known world had gathered there in Jerusalem for this festival. I want you to tell somebody, God's timing... Tell them, God's timing is so cool. God's timing is so cool. Nobody could have arranged the details of Jesus' death, of his resurrection, and of the sending of his spirit. Man, I, man I, I'm excited for his return. This was God's doing according to his timetable. And I don't know about you, but that gives me great hope and confidence. That tells me that it's not just up to me. 
at the end of the day. It's not just up to you. It's not just up to our efforts to somehow make this happen. It's not just up to my ability to be faithful and my ability to persevere as important as those things are. But ultimately, you and I can rest assured that God will accomplish his work because the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. When he says it, he's going to do it. His sovereign plan will come to pass. He's going to do it. He will raise up a people for himself, full of his spirit. Because even in the midst of his grief and pain over the condition of his people, I believe, he's always preparing a people for himself. Somebody say always. Always, always preparing a people for himself. It's the story from the beginning to the end of the Bible. He's always preparing a people for himself. He always has and always will. And folks, listen to me. Not simply a people who, are so, who will survive, but a people who will thrive. Amen. Who will thrive. Notice again what Ezekiel writes. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Think about what God was showing Ezekiel. Wouldn't it have been enough Right? They say this during Passover, Dayenu, you know. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been enough if God simply showed these dry bones just coming to life? I mean, that would have been enough. That would have been cool. Somehow the, these dry, very dry bones becoming this large people group. That, that would have been enough. That would have been spectacular. That would have been marvelous, you know. That would have been incredible. But instead, they came to life and stood on their feet and they became what? They became what? A vast army. Maybe you'll help me with my pronunciation, Natan, at this point. Chayil gadot meyod meyod. Chayil gadot gadol meyod meyod. And think about it. An army, great, very very. That's what it says literally. An army. Great. Very. Very. In other words, the, the translators are trying to like figure out how do we put this exactly in English? How do we put it? It's an army. It's very, very great. An army that's exceedingly, abundantly massive. It's, it's this, this, this vast, vast army. Listen, you and I might look at the condition of the church, the condition of God's people, hoping that we somehow just make it through at this point in America. Somehow that we just survive in this tidal wave of sin and compromise. Some of you here, or maybe even watching online, have thought, well, maybe the best days of the church have gone by, and now it's just a matter of just, you know, somehow making it through, just somehow surviving. But I want to remind you today that we still serve a God who brings us from bones to breakthrough. And that tells me that no matter how bleak things might be, no matter how badly the odds might be set against us, God is able to transform ordinary people like you and me into a mighty, mighty army for his glory. For his glory. His glory. So regardless of how, how hopeless a time the future might seem, folks, listen to me. The best is always yet to come in Messiah Jesus. You hear me? The best is always, you can't just say the best is always yet to come. You can't say that. You can't take that personally. But you can say this, the best is always yet to come in Jesus. Amen. In Jesus. I'm going to ask the musicians to come at this time. Kirsten, one of the Christian workers that we support in a sensitive area in the Middle East, she writes in her latest newsletter, I was asking how this new friend, Maha, and her family had come to the country we found ourselves in. In her district, in her distinct Iraqi dialect, she shared how her daughter was born with a heart problem. When she was a few months old, 
they found themselves in the hospital trying to decide what course of action to take. Maha's daughter was on oxygen and the doctor said she needed surgery. It was around that time that Maha received a vision in which Jesus told her not to be afraid. He was going to heal her daughter. In her vision, she saw Jesus operate on her daughter and then told Maha to take her daughter off oxygen and bring her home. When she told her husband the vision, he confirmed that he had also received a similar vision. In obedience, let me pause. I didn't say in presumption. She writes in obedience. They went to the hospital to do as Jesus told them in their vision. Believing in faith, she was healed. The doctor incredulously asked, you are willing to risk your daughter's life based on a vision? She won't live if you take her now. And even if she does, she will face serious health problems. Rejecting his counsel, they brought her home and saw her grow and flourish under their eyes. Maha and her husband, listen, a prominent sheikh at the local mosque at the time, began to study the scriptures in secret to learn more about this Jesus. Through God's word, they came to understand the message of the gospel and through many signs and wonders, gave their lives to him. Due to religious persecution, she writes, they later fled to a neighboring nation where I met them just two months ago. To this day, Kirsten writes, their daughter's health is stable. And Maha testifies that she has a scar over her heart from where Jesus did his miraculous surgery. I want you to listen to these closing words of, of Kirsten. This is the church Jesus is building. He is reaching, revealing, healing, and drawing men and women to himself. Despite the many obstacles and challenges, he is building and establishing his church. It's really happening. There really is nothing impossible for him. There is no place his spirit can't reach and no life he can't transform. Can you say amen? amen. Folks, he's doing it. He's doing it. He's really doing it. God is taking his people from bones to breakthrough. Let's trust him today. Let's stand on his word today. Let's believe him to do it right here, right in this place, all around this county, throughout this region, all around the world, because he's doing it. God is transforming from bones to breakthrough. Let's trust him today to transform us. Little old us, little old weak need, often weak-willed believers into a vast and mighty army for his glory. I'm going to ask you to stand across this room. Let's believe him to fill us and send us out across the street, maybe like Kirsten and others, around the world with the power and the love, the good news of Jesus. Let's believe him to fill us, to fill us because we're smart enough, no. Because we're rich enough, we're wealthy enough, no. Because we're capable enough, no. We're strong enough, no. But because God is still in the business of bringing his people from bones to breakthrough. Bones to breakthrough. I'm just going to ask you to begin to come from around this room today and just turn this entire space into a meeting place, an altar where you and I can meet with God. 
that you just begin to come as the team begins to lead us. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, to break every chain. There's an army he's, that is rising up. There's an army that's rising up to break every chain. Come, press in today. Make room for others. Make room for a vast army, a mighty army that no pastor could ever raise up. But God is alone. God alone is doing it. Jesus. Listen, you need healing today. You need breakthrough today. I'm going to ask you to come to this front spot as close as you can. You need healing. You want others to pray with you. I'm going to ask you to come as others to come. You say, yes, I need a breakthrough. I need others to pray with me. I'm going to ask you to come as close as you can along this bridge. Prayer team, please be ready to pray. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Come on, let's make it our declaration today. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, this is needing healing, needing a breakthrough in your life today. There is Just power. Press in. Press in to the in we're going to pray with you. We're going to pray with you. Press again today. Prayer team, come. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. So break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. There's an army rising up. Every chain, break every chain, break every chain. So break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an army, there's an army rising up. There's an army rising chain break every chain break every chain there is power there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus be an open vessel for him today there is power in the name of Jesus Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. If you need prayer, just press in. You need others to pray with you today. Just press in if you need prayer. Others are ready to pray with you. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, do the work that only you can do in the church. We're desperate for you, oh God. We're desperate for you, oh God. There is power. Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, in the name of Jesus, break every chain, in the name of break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain. Come on, let's declare it with the team. Let's declare this with the team. Declare it with them today. We're declaring, God, you are the way maker. You are the promise keeper. You're going to do it, oh God. I worship you. I worship you. You are I worship you. I worship you. 
all about you, you Lord. It's about your glory, you your honor, your name, Lord Jesus. Moving amen. We declare our dependence upon I you. I worship you. I worship you. Every good gift. I worship you. Fill the Holy Spirit. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. We say yes to you, Lord. I worship you. We say yes to you. I worship. clap offering. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let the army of the Lord make a shout. Let the army of the Lord raise a war cry. Let's raise a war cry. Hallelujah. Let the walls fall. Let the walls fall. Thank you, Lord. We raise a war cry. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
Hallelujah. For the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form in Christ Jesus, and you have been given fullness in Christ. You've been given fullness in Christ. Listen, I pray today that we would go from this place whenever you're ready to, that we would go from this place as a mighty, triumphant army, knowing that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. That no weapon formed against us shall prosper. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably, exceedingly, abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And everyone shouted, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Even when, 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 when,